Hello, everyone. It is Tuesday, and you know what that means. We are back with Tuesdays with Miss Tampa, and I could not be more excited to introduce my guest this week, none other than Laura Rutledge. She is a sportscaster. She is one of my biggest role models. You may not know, she's Miss Florida 2012. So I'm so excited to see you, Laura. Thank you for being here. I'm honored to be here with you, and for those of you out here watching, you know that you have one of the most wonderful Miss Tampas ever in the history of Miss Tampa, and Leah is the absolute best, so I am honored to be a guest on Tuesdays with Miss Tampa. Well, thank you. To get us started, can you share a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, where you are now, what you're doing? Okay, so I am actually from Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, and I lived there for uh, a good portion of my early life, and then we moved to the panhandle of Florida um, when I was in elementary school and lived there for a little bit. I was there through middle school. We ended up in Orlando after that, and kind of throughout all that time, I was really interested in the arts, so I did a lot of ballet. I also played instruments, piano, violin dulcimer drums all kinds of random things but i love music and love the arts and so that was kind of what i mostly did in my early life really did not play a lot of sports which is funny because as you mentioned i'm i'm now a sports caster and that whole path to get to that point is hilarious but um then i went to college in partially in well, I went to high school partially in Orlando and then also spent some time in China during my high school years and went to a ballet boarding school in Washington, D.C. So I was all over the place during that time and then went to college at University of Florida, go Gators. And from there, uh, that's when I really kind of got interested in my career. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. But um, that was also my first introduction to the Miss America organization while I was in college at the first time. I never even watched a pageant until 2010, which is funny because that's the first year I actually competed in one. Um, and then from there, uh, just a lot of amazing doors were opened and some closed as well for me throughout my early part of my career. And then now I work for ESPN and I host a show called Get Up in New York City. That's been a little bit weird right now with everything going on. And then I host a show called SEC Nation on SEC Network during college football season and a variety of other things. My husband's name is Josh and we have been married for six and a half years, almost seven years, which is crazy. Not almost, but it'll be seven years in December. And we have a little dog named Remy, and most recently, we have a little baby daughter named Reese, who is seven months old. So that's me. <laughs> yes. And I know at your work, you travel a lot. How is the virus affecting your work schedule, your home life, all of that? Right. So first of all, I am so thankful just to be healthy, and I feel like that's something that you know, all of us are going to be even more thankful for than we were in the past. And I just continue to pray for all the people who are not healthy right now and who are so negatively affected by this. But we were based in New York City primarily for the show Get Up, which is broadcast out of New York City on ESPN. And so uh, it was actually on St. Patrick's Day when I finally just decided, you know what, we are getting out of here because this is not going to be safe for my child as well as my mom, who is 65. And she was there and I just thought I cannot continue to jeopardize them as well as my husband and, and myself. And so we road tripped all the way from New York down to Alabama, which is where we had been living before I got transferred to New York. And so that's where we've been. And I've been doing a lot of broadcasting from our house, which is funny because that's just a whole different world. And I feel like now everyone that watches TV is like watching everyone's house <laughs> to see what people's houses look like. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been me. I, in fact, shows, which is, is amazing to think about that technology working, but I, that's usually what I do. Um, and then, you know, I've been trying to find ways to um, create content and do a lot of different things. And I feel like my creative juices have been flowing a lot more than they were before. So I'm, I'm glad for that. And then otherwise, just trying to focus on being a good mom and, and doing the best I can with Reese. And I feel like, you know, this is, there's so many things about a baby's first year that are just incredible. And 
things are changing every day and they're learning new things and new things are happening to them. And I, I am very thankful for all this extra time with her because I would have missed out on a lot of, of that development just because I had so many trips that I was going to have to take for work. And I love that. But I also, I, I also think that that's been just a silver lining for us as a family to be able to spend a lot of time together. Yes, there definitely are some positives coming out of this virus. I know my family has been able to spend a whole time together. So also Yes. Okay, so you mentioned you know you did until 2010, but what got you hooked to really do your first pageant and then what did you learn and gain from being Miss Florida? So Leah, you know this because you've known me for years and you know that I'm not necessarily the typical, probably what you would think of as a pageant contestant. And that's one of the things that I love about the Miss America organization because nothing is typical about it. And so sort of those, you know, preconceived notions that people may have about what a pageant girl is, uh, it just truly is not that. And so for me, when I was at UF, uh, some of my friends signed me up for the Miss UF pageant at, kind of as a joke. And I was like, are you guys kidding me? Because I can't do this. I'm not, I've never even seen a pageant. What are we talking about here? Um, but I, I realized as I started to get involved and the Miss America organization has changed so much even since then, that was 10 years ago, which is crazy to think about. But um, when I started to get involved, I realized, okay, this is a way to continue to work on myself as a person, to work on something that's going to benefit my academics because I'm going to get scholarship money for it, and to be able to do my talent, which was dance, which I, I love dancing, and I had kind of had to give it up because that, I, that wasn't going to be my profession, and so I, I, it was a way to keep doing that. And so I ended up, I did Miss UF that first year in 2010. I did not win. I got first runner up. And I was hooked because I thought this is going to make me better for all those reasons that I just mentioned. So that year I did three local pageants and ended up, I finally won Miss Suncoast. It was one of the last pageants. It was part of the Miss Miami pageant. And I remember rolling up to the Miss, the, the Miss Miami pageant thinking, oh my goodness, I have no chance. What am I doing? But they were giving away three titles. I thought, we'll see what I can do. And all these people were rolling in with all these gowns and these like big fancy carts and these mirrors. And I'm like over there, you know, I've got my gown like crumpled up. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing and how I'm going to make this work. And, um, it was just incredible. I can't believe I, I actually won one. And when it finally happened, it was like, are you kidding me? This is amazing. And so I went to Miss Florida that first year and and I realized that what I was gaining from just competing and from making friends and from learning from these other young women was so valuable that I thought, I'm going to keep going back. I'm going to keep doing this. And so the next year, I really wanted to be Miss St. Pete because I lived in St. Pete and I was the Tampa Bay Rays reporter at the time. So I thought, if I could just win Miss St. Pete. So I won Miss St. Pete. And then I ended up that year, I got second runner up at Miss Florida. And I thought, my goodness, that is definitely the highest I'm ever going to go here. Like I bet it might as well just throw the towel in and like be proud. And I was so proud and I was so proud of everybody. And it was just some of my greatest friends have come from the organization. So anyway, almost did not even do a third year, but my third year competing was my final year. I was going to age out and I had just started dating my husband, Josh, and he had never seen me dance. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to do a local pageant so he can see me dance. And it's my last chance. I'm just going to see if I win. And if I don't, then it must be God's timing and God's sign that I'm just not supposed to do this this year. And that's totally great. And I was, I was really happy with that. So I sort of cobbled together this dance. It was to a song. It was John Mayer's Slow Dancing in a Burning Room, which we had liked. We had liked the song. Like we hadn't been dating that long. And it was just, I thought, you know what? This will be fun. Well, I ended up barely scraping by and winning Miss Pinellas County. I don't even know how I won because I was a mess. But anyway, they, I guess they saw potential or something. And that was the year that I won Miss Florida. And, and the funny thing about it and what I would say about that is that I was at that time, probably the truest to myself that I had been in my life, you know, just up until that point, I, I would say now I'm a little more sure of myself than I was then. And that just happens with age and time and experience. But I was finally just truly being me and saying, you know what, I know that I may not be exactly prepared for this, just like other people are, but I also have my own skill set that I'm bringing to the table. And I'm just going to have so much fun and soak all this up. And I remember even being an evening gown, which would always give me so much worry evening gown, because I'd be like, I'm going to fall down and I'm not very good at walking on stage in a dress. And these are not things that I've practiced for a long time. 
And so anyway, I, I remember though, just looking up in the audience and just soaking it all in and being like, this is such an amazing feeling. And I think that really, I mean, it's such a toss up every year of who's going to win these things. But I do think that that made a difference that particular year in me winning Miss Florida. So anyway, I could not believe it. I still can't believe that I won. I went to Miss America. It was an incredible experience. So much fun. I was one of the last, I, I guess I was the last year or one of the last years that they were in Vegas. I think maybe the last year. So my experience was totally different from those who have gone, you know, in Atlantic city. And then obviously now, It just it was it was wild and fun and uh, so intense but also amazing and and still to this day I am friends with so many of those women and it that part of it I think really is so amazing and people don't realize that you know you really do get this incredible bond with people all over the country which is so cool so I loved it and it's something that I will always hold uh, very near and dear to my heart. Yes, and that last year when you won, I had the opportunity to be your princess. Yes. It was like the best year ever. <laughs> people always ask me, they're like, you know Laura Rutledge? Like, ah. I'm like, oh my goodness, if you knew, she is so down to earth. You have really been like a great sister to me and really one of the best role models in my life. You are so sweet. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> And you mentioned you went to the University of Florida. What advice do you have for college women in terms of pursuing their career goals? Yeah. So, you know, when I got to UF, I really did not know what I wanted to do. And I had been very dead set on the ballet path and then kind of at the last minute decided, well, I'm going to go accept my acceptance to Florida and I'm going to go and do this instead. Um, so I was kind of looking for something to do. And I loved doing I loved anything communications wise. So I, I never thought I would really be doing sports. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think my biggest piece of advice is that you just want to keep yourself super open-minded. So a lot of, I'll get a lot of messages from people saying, okay, well, what exactly should I major in? And, and yes, your major is so important and you want to, you know, be able to look at that and say, okay, this is a degree that is going to funnel me directly into the job that I want, but it's not always that simple. And so I say all of this to say that you should just major in something that, you know, might even be broader and that might be better. Um, but then also find ways to create your own niches on your own. And so like, even when I was at Florida, they didn't have a sports broadcasting major. Now they have something that is, is more similar to that. But so I, I couldn't even really do that. So I spent a lot of my time doing my sports internships and doing all kinds of radio work and things like that. That was how I sort of built up my own niche while I was getting a news degree, which I think that that actually helped me because it made me more well-rounded. So being as well-rounded as possible, gathering as many pieces of experience and experience as you possibly can, no matter what your career is going to be, I think it just can only help. And I would also say, no matter what your career is, you're going to need to be a decent writer. So even, obviously it helps to be a great writer, but not everybody's a great writer. I'm terrible at math. I'm better at writing. So like if somebody told me I needed to be good at math, I'd be like, are you kidding me? Because I'm ruined. But I do think that in every business now and in, in every career field, writing is beneficial. And so I, I would just say, you know, obviously if you're going into journalism, you want to be more specific with your writing and there's a specific style of writing and all of that. But in general, just practice writing. And even if there's a class that you can take for writing, that's, that's always something that I think will be valuable to fall back on. That is great advice. And then in terms of your career, uh, have you had any challenges as a female in the sports industry? Yes. Um, yes. And look, what I would say about that is that I am determined to never use that as an excuse. I, I do not ever want to be like, oh, well, this happened to me because I'm a woman and people don't respect women in this field. There is some of that still, which is sad because I feel like we should be beyond it, but we're not. And that's okay. Because what I would like to do is continue to work on my field and my career to where the next generation of all of you that are going to be in this business are not going to have to deal with some of these same things. And, and I say all of that with also the knowledge that there are so many improvements and it has gotten so much better and it's so much more mainstream to see women that are broadcasting sports and all of that. I think our next step as women uh, collectively in this business is to see women 
age on television and <laughs> be on TV for as long as men are. Um, it's been interesting watching the Jordan documentary. You see like Robin Roberts, who was at that time in the 90s, you know, relatively new and young on TV. Now she's obviously still at the highest level. You see Hannah Storm, who's been a part of that. Andrea Kramer, another one who who is still working. But we don't see as many of the women who were journalists at that time still going and that some of that may be their own decision but i think a lot of it is the decision of society to say well all men are allowed to age on tv but women really aren't and so that's something that i'm really passionate about trying to continue to break that mold in some way shape or form and i would say i think right now um you know espn the company that i work for does a great job of continuing to keep women on on air just because of their credibility and that's that's what it should be right i get it it's a visual medium so at some point that is part of it but i think trying to put credibility over everything else and and just people's reporting chops and journalistic chops is is really really important so um, yes there are many challenges and i would say social media has made it more challenging there are a lot of just mean spirited people out there who want to doubt you. But what I would say too, is that I found more and more my ability to let that roll off my back is, is improving <laughs> and I don't become as affected by it as I used to. And I wish I could say that it never affected me, but that's just not the truth. It, it has affected me and has made me feel lesser than and all of that. And that's just, um, I would hate for, other women to feel that way but i also think it's part of the process and it's part of just getting that thicker skin but also you know remaining empathetic to everybody that that you're going to come in contact with and so it's a mixture of of finding your way through a crazy forest but um at the end of the day also finding ways to stay true to yourself that is so important and i think one of the biggest questions that a lot of people are having during this time College football, is it going to happen? What are your predictions? <laughs> okay, so, well, first of all, you know that college football is my heart and soul. So yeah. I am hoping so hard every single day that it just goes off on time and everything's great. Um, I think that's a little bit of an unrealistic way to look at it, though. And, and what I've heard in, in a lot of the people that I've talked to you know, they've got a number of challenges that they're dealing with. And I think right now, the interesting thing is that because the reopening of states is so regional, that there are parts of the country that just are not going to be able to reopen as soon as others and parts of the country that are not governed that way, where they say, okay, we're not comfortable opening back up. And then some say, well, we are. And so trying to keep everything unified is going to be really difficult. And that's where it gets even bigger picture, more complicated, because what happens to the NCAA and all of this? Do some of these power five conferences just say, you know what, we're going to go off on our own. We're doing our own thing. We're going to play this other conference, but otherwise we're just going to play it ourselves. Who knows? You know, and I think that's what we're faced with right now. The one good thing about college football is that we do have a little bit more time on our side. So what I would predict is that we will have a college football season in the 2020-21 school year. But I would be shocked if it goes off on time um, as planned. Now, maybe they say we can start, but we're not going to have fans in the stands. And, and I think that's possible. And I think we'll see the NFL do that. We'll see other pro sports do that. The one clarification with that, with college football, is that most of the revenue from college football comes from the fans. And so the fan attendance, while it's not as important in other sports, is essential in college football and essential for universities to continue on, essential for other sports to continue on. So they're going to try as hard as they can to make sure that fans can be in the stands, but maybe they try to phase them in as the season goes on. So um, there are so many uh, – possibilities there's so many ideas they're making all these contingency plans and all i hope is that we can have college football but that it's also safe for everybody involved yes yes totally okay and so since you mentioned you lived in saint pete as miss tampa i love to ask people things they love about tampa or why oh. they live there what is one thing you loved about the tampa bay area and working and living there I love it so much and still love it. And in fact, we, when I lived there, I lived on Pasigrill, so St. Pete Beach. Uh -huh. And we actually still, my mom and I loved it so much that we go back 
all the time and we will go and like just rent a little place. Sometimes we'll stay in my old condo if we can get it rented, but sometimes it's hard to get it. Um, and we just, it's just a very special place. I think it was, it's one of those things where, you know, there's obviously some nostalgia involved, but looking back on it, I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize how lucky I was to live here. I look back and just appreciate, you know, not only that area, but the state of Florida in general for being just such a beautiful place and somewhere that I will always love. Um, but the food is one thing that I love a lot about the town. Tampa Bay area. There's so many good restaurants. And I would also just say the beaches are gorgeous. Um, and you know, Clearwater and, and Tampa Bay and just St. Pete beach, all of it just absolutely beautiful. And I actually lived in Tampa for a part of the time, uh, that I was still in Florida and it was actually Josh and I's first apartment together was in Tampa. And so we love, uh, that area as well. And just being able to see the views and, and how gorgeous it is. There is so cool. It's also a really neat sports town. I, people don't give it enough credit for that. You've got the bucks, you've obviously got the rays. Um, and then you, you have the lightning. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really cool to see kind of all the sports that are there and how people value them. Because I, I think that gets underrated a little bit about, Tampa as a town in general. Oh yes, they are strong about their sports, which is something <laughs> I you do too. Right. The last thing I want to ask is what is the one thing you are most looking forward to once quarantine is over? Great question. Okay, I really think I mean I realize there's a food theme here, but I really think that I cannot wait and to just go into a restaurant and order food and sit down and like be able to talk to people. Um, you know, I'm very close with a lot of my ESPN friends and I miss them and I, I miss just friends in general. So being able to just gather at a restaurant and order food that I'm not cooking, uh, because to be honest, I probably could improve in my cooking and <laughs> I like the food that's, that's a little bit better. Um, so yeah, that's just good. I just think there's so many things like that, that we have always taken for granted that we will not take for granted anymore. So, um, that would be my thing. What about you? I'm curious for your answer for that. Definitely to stop cooking. I think my sister and I have been cooking every night for my brothers, my dad, the whole family, We're all living here under the same <laughs> which is crazy right now. <laughs> so peace and quiet a little bit would be nice. Yes. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I love your family. You have to tell everybody I say hi. Oh, of course. Same to your family. Love them so much. I cannot thank you enough for sitting down and talking with me. You are one of my favorite people in the world and I just love following you. I love you so much and I'm so proud of you and I'm so excited to watch your journey this year and your journey uh, at Miss Florida as well when that happens because yes. I'm still planning to be there. So I will see oh, all of you there. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank and you, Leah. Bye and the whole family. <laughs> of course.